This is the OGM weekly call of March 24th, 2022. Um, and it's kind of a weird moment. And I was just reflecting on it because we are, um, we're not quite post pandemic. Pandemic is still outdoors. Pandemic may never go away. Pandemic may become endemic. Who knows? There's lots of interesting things to say about that. But it feels like um, Putin's attack on Ukraine and Biden's State of the Union and his responses and a bunch of other things are creating some sort of new space that we're in some kind of new, new zone. Uh, not quite sure what it is or how to describe it. But uh, I'll, I'll pause for a second. Oh, Pete, thank you. I forgot. I remember the recording. Now. I was like, like five minutes ago, I was like, and this time I'm going to remember to enable the transcript. Uh, but there we are. And uh, so I was just saying that it feels like we're at some transition point. And then this morning I read Anne Helen Peterson's newsletter, which I subscribe to. Uh, she used to work at BuzzFeed. She and Charlie Wartzell, who writes a tech column, are partners. And they both are beautiful writers, so they're worth, worth kind of reading. And her column is about the shift or the change or what's going on. And it points to, um, an, uh, it points to a column let me see, let me actually just share my brain for a second because I've started annotating it this morning. Um, so here's today's call. And then basically I had a thought um, so that there's kind of, we're kind of at some kind of interesting tipping point at this point. And here's the, <laughs> bless you. Uh, there was an article that, that happened when Putin uh, launched his assault on, on Ukraine, which was uh, Putin's invasion of, Russia's invasion of Ukraine changes everything. And changes everything is like sort of sensational as speaking and who knows what. But it kind of rang a bell for me because I've been tracking kind of the, the mood or the state or, or something like that. And I already had this, this thought about Putin's inability to, to just blitzkrieg Ukraine and take it over. Uh, Biden's State of the Union, where some Republicans were actually applauding and contributing, and a bunch of other things. Because before that, before that, I have a thought where the coronavirus plus Black Lives Matter plus the boogaloo equals the perfect storm. Is this the start of meltdown? And you'll see I have a lot of things under here. I was like, oh my God, this feels like a really horrible time. And I think we're, we're at this at this dot now as COVID, uh, the New York Times uh, on the cover of their website every day has yesterday's new infections in the US and deaths. And the, the deaths number just kept standing uh, under 2000, then it was above 1000 and it slipped under 1000. And I was able sort of to breathe differently when I saw the number slip under 1000 dead per day, which is still a lot of humans being hurt by this thing. Um, so, it, so I'm feeling like we've, we've slipped into some different, um, moment and I'm wondering if anybody else is feeling that and, um, how it goes, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, and, and let's just sort of start, start with whoever would like to pick up from there. Um, and then see where it takes us. Gil, do you want to talk about Gramsci? Um, yeah, I've been um, I've been feeling what you've been describing, Jerry, since the beginning of the pandemic. Um, and uh, <clears throat> excuse me, a couple of years ago, I started calling calling this living between worlds. Um, that was the mood that I felt. And, um, and it, it, as some of you know, I've been hosting a monthly conversation around that theme. Uh, and Gramsci, or at least this is Zizek's uh, translation of Gramsci, kind of gives a shape to that. You know, it's it's clear that something is dying. At least the pole, at least the po the the the, the post World War II global order is um, that, that deck is getting shuffled very very strongly, and we don't know where we're going. Uh, we know that something new is coming. It could be ugly. It could be great. It, it more likely will be a, a, a you know a, a, a strange mix of good and bad. But the ability to predict feels shattered. And I've just given up my, you know, long time tendency to try to predict what's coming, um, uh, uh, to take on a much lighter approach, to be able to listen and anticipate and dance with what's coming, knowing that it's going to be really, really messy. 
uh, in all the dimensions that you talked about and many more. You didn't mention climate very much, uh, but notable in the first week of the, um, of the Russian invasion of Ukraine, the, uh, the IPCC released its latest report, uh, which said, holy shit, this is even worse than we thought, et cetera, you know, elaborate words to that effect. And it blipped in the mainstream media and then vanished. Um, you know, in this inability to hold more than one subject in line at a time or deal with complex thoughts in any way, it was just gone. And yet this is, you know, profound existential persists long past whatever settlement happens in Europe. And yet there it wasn't. Um, Biden in his State of the Union um, started to, you know, started to hint at climate and climate responses. Um, McKibben and various others had encouraged him to make that a cornerstone of the State of the Union speech, tying it to the, to, the, to, the, to the Putin war and the need for energy independence from Putin and Saudi Arabia and so forth. And he stepped back from that. He had, like you said, he had Republicans applauding him. He had various bipartisan notes and he could have dropped a climate note and forced the Republicans to applaud it and box them in and for whatever calculations, they, he decided not to do that. He and his team decided not to do that. So yeah, a perfect storm is kind of too happy a term to use for this, but there we are. Uh, I think the pandemic, uh, I, uh, my assumption, <clears throat> excuse me, is that you're right, that this is more of a pandemic era than a pandemic uh, because the circumstances that give rise to this pandemic uh, are unchanged. You know, um, global trade, human, human, human nature interface, wild animal trade, immune suppression in the global population, uh, toxic environment behind it all, which nobody seems to speak about. Um, um, you know, so there's no reason to think that there won't be more pandemic, distrust of government breakdown of public health coordination systems socially. Um, there's no reason to trust that that won't happen again. Uh, you know, on, on the bright side, the for all of its flaws, the COVID response was remarkable. The level of the momentum and the level of international coordination, uh, though flawed, was quite stunning. Um, you look at the response to the Russian invasion, the level of international coordination, absolutely stunning. Mm -hmm. uh, some people are afraid of that. They see that as the imposition of, of the will of somebody on all the rest of us. But you know, what, what happens in crises and messes? Um, something you know things move things move and things move quickly and so i'm really i'm really struck by the grand prix quote which i think was exactly 100 years ago this year i'm not totally sure i'm trying to track that down um <clears throat> because we're in this soup where um um in the disorder new things can potentially emerge very quickly that's good and bad we don't know um um, there's, you know, we've had the, the, the thread that Neil and others were doing on the group chat. Oh, hi, April. I can see you there in the corner. Um, 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 you know, uh, uh, how, how people interpret and act in the face of their calculation. You know, if, are, if you're, are you a doomsday? Do you think we're doomed? Do you think we're not? If we're doomed, what do you do? If you don't think we're doomed, what do you do? Uh, how do you live in this? And so I'm, I'm just sort of immersed in those questions all the time uh, in conversations with people at various levels, ranging from these kind of general chats to much more directed, uh, you know, I'm trying to build a fund that's aimed at a piece of the puzzle to try to move a piece of the puzzle. And that may be all that any of us can do is, you know, is, is move, you know, is, is move the pieces where we're moved to move <laughs> and then share across these different interests about what, you know, what are we doing? How do we support each other? Where are the synergies? Um, um, where are the opportunities? I know there's been a lot of discussion about sense-making. I'm, I'm sort of agnostic on sense-making. I don't think there's a lot of sense to be made right now. And I think that's a, that's a grasping for something that is not within reach. Um, so I'm, I'm sort of amused. It, it, it's like sense-making seems to be trending these days, which is not at all surprising given the mess. Um, and I, I think my, my rambling meter went off a little while ago. So ah, now. That's funny, but great. Thank, thanks, Gil. Uh, yeah. Stuart, and then I want to mix a little something else into the conversation. Yeah. Uh, uh, great. So uh, yeah, shout out. Uh, April and Marilee, nice to see you both here. Um, 
I, I saw a headline yesterday. I didn't dig into it about the pandemic, just saying, well, it looks like it's going to be uh, seasonal, kind of like the flu in some sense, and we'll deal with it in that way. And I guess the barometer for that is probably going to be, um, you know, how flooded uh, ERs are and how, you know, how much um, how many ventilators that, that people are on. I wanted to speak to the broader phenomenon that 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 Gil was just referencing. Um, I think that we we can no longer rely on government. It's just too big. It's it's like turning around a battleship. It's just absolutely massive. And especially the dissonance in the US with one side pulling one way, another side pulling the other way. And these idiots just can't seem to, uh, um, you know, start rowing in the same direction about the, the, the global challenges we have. What I'm sensing is a, is a, is a, a bubbling up. Um, and, I, and I think that the, the bubbling up is gonna uh, pull uh, uh, governments in the right way. Um, and the situation in, in, in Ukraine and Russia is just begging for some kind of planetary governance, absolutely begging. It's just essential at this point in time. And I realized that I, I said planetary governance and I said bubbling up. <laughs> so, so pretty much yeah. almost in the same paragraph. <laughs> yes. So, so there's, as to echo Gill, there is no sense making in the traditional sense, although, you know, there's a lot of people trying to make things work. I, I you know, I, sh I shout out to Neil Davidson. Uh, I hope everybody dug into what he was pointing at because I thought it was a, a, um, a wonderful articulation of uh, what's needed right now. Yeah, thank you. So let me take a little tiny step back. Uh, the topic for today came from Eric who posted on Mattermost uh, about this moment and uh, used flux with caps. And I'm like, oh, that's nice. And, uh, and, and there's, a, there's a funny little book that's right over my shoulder here in my new little corner to do things. And author of said book is, is, has joined us for, for today. Um, and, I'd and, and flux happens to be about your mindset for how to cope with change, which I think is sort of central to the conversation, but also Parmjit, uh, who has been a regular here, introduced me to Marilee Adams, who has also joined us. And Marilee is the author of Change Your Questions, Change Your Life. And she and I have had a couple conversations lately, which have been wonderful, and is in the same realm of things and is, is, uh, has a, a change model that uh, is really useful. So I think that, that we should sort of fold those ingredients into the conversation at some point uh, soon and, uh, and then see where this all takes us. But it feels like it feels like some mental focus on dealing with this moment would be uh, useful all around. And we've had several, we've approached this in several different ways on the list, on, uh, on the mailing list. So, um, and then, uh, oh, uh, this is funny. And uh, April, uh, April DM'd me that Merrily is also published with, with Barrett Kaler, which I didn't realize. So I had no idea you were, so you're both BK authors, which is really, yeah, really we, cool. Hi, Marilee. It's nice to see you. <laughs> Jerry, we've known each other for a couple of years. Marilee, I don't know if you know that Jerry's my husband. No, I didn't. Uh, oh. Okay, so, so. No idea at all. There we go. Yeah, yeah, I, and like we're in the same house right now and all the rest. And I think yeah. many of these people, Dave, Doug, Stuart knows. Uh, Pete, like I see many, many familiar faces here that I haven't seen in a long time. So hi, everybody. Um, and then I see some some new faces too. And Marilee, I just assumed you'd been joining these calls and I was like, oh, that's awesome. Um, so, so yeah, just to connect a couple dots there. Anyway, I'm excited to listen to everybody and uh, greetings all. Thanks. Um, and I'm wondering, April, do you want to report in for just a second, not on not on the content of flux and approaching the change, but just how you're feeling in the moment. Just, just like, uh, are you feeling a shift or not a shift? Any, anything like that? Just, just your reflections on what's up for you now. Yeah, um, I'll try to keep it brief. Um, yes, I'm feeling a shift. Uh, I can't say that I'm feeling it in one direction or another. And people continue to ask me like, Gil, I think a little bit to your point, like what's next, what's next, what's next? And I'm kind of like, there's just more of everything and not more in like a necessarily a quantitative um, sense. There's, there's just more of more ways to do everything. There's uh, more reason to be hopeful. 
there's more reason to be anxious. There's, there are more ways to earn income than ever before in terms of like future of work stuff. And there are more reasons to be concerned about the inequities that could be exacerbated. There's more, you know, and so, you know, I love Gil, the way that I'm introducing flux pretty much in every, um, in every talk I give in some way is just the messiness of it all. And the fact that we, we have this word change or flux, but change that we, we treat like it's one thing, it's one word. And like, we all assume that there's a kind of, there's change. It's like, no, there are so many different kinds of changes that we love and we hate and we embrace and we struggle with and that, it, that excite us and that completely unravel us and like, bleh. So let's get beyond talking about it like change. And also let's get beyond some of the navel gazing conversations potential that's there. Um, so I'm sensing a shift, but it's against this backdrop of the messiness. Um, I would say also, as some of you know, um, this year I am laser, laser, laser focused on taking Flux Global. So last year was English uh, and technically the global launch in English, but um, we're now up, Jerry knows this, I'm very excited. We're now up to 12 foreign languages. So the book is, the book turns seven months old today. And so we've got 12 languages, which in total reach more than half of the global population in their native language. So um, I'm really excited about that. And I share this simply because the shift that we're seeing, I can't say that I can comment on it yet globally, but thus far what I see is, that shift isn't playing out the same way everywhere, for sure. Um, and that's related to a lot of dynamics. Are you living in an individualist society or a collectivist society? Are you, uh, I don't wanna say man or woman, or he, she, they, sort of. Are you young or old? I think when we look to the future and how much future do you have at stake, right? Um, these are the things that I'm, I'm really trying to track and, and Gil not predict, but just listen and observe. And so I think that there too, when I say, do I see a shift? Yes, but it's, it's not one shift. Um, and it's not a collect, I don't, I don't see that it's a collective dis-ease. I see that it's a collective, it's, it's a, it's a spectrum of people going like, hmm, my stomach is not the same as it was. <laughs> I have this funny feeling, Jerry, to your point, this funny feeling in my stomach and I don't really know what to do with it. Mm -hmm. So I'll sense. pause there for now, but oh, yeah. Thanks, April. Um, Marilee, I'd love to just give you the floor for where we are in the conversation. And then I'd love to pass to Eric just to riff on what gave you the spark for, for suggesting this. Marilee, go ahead. There's so many, oh, am I on mute? Yes, we can hear you just fine. Okay. I, I, I have like six streams of conversations in my head. I don't know which one to go to. Excellent. <laughs> but, but obviously we're living inside of massive uncertainty. And um, I was just looking at a book by Richard Rohr that's called um, The Wisdom Pattern, Order, Disorder, and Reorder. And um, I think that's a good description it's, it's, but it's too neat <laughs> but because this is also very, 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 very messy. Um, I do think that living with, that being not comfortable, but at least patient with uncertainty is absolutely vital for our individual and collective well-being. And I think the only thing, not the only thing, but the thing that can really ground skillfully, that can ground us there is being in inquiry moment by moment by moment by moment. What now? Who am I? What am I bringing to it? What am I seeing? What am I not seeing? Um, what are others seeing? And for reasons that are not explicable to me right now, I, I, I'm, I'm focusing on that moment that I saw on the news yesterday when the, um, in, in Judge Brown's uh, Jackson's um, hearings when one of the senators was really being pretty abusive and said, 
well, you don't expect me to believe that, do you? And she said, it was so beautiful. She said, yes, Senator, I do. And I thought that was such a beautiful moment of, um, with so much that went into it that allowed her the dignity and the groundedness to say that in front of gazillions of people. Yes, Senator, I do. I tell the truth. <laughs> I, I just thought that was beautiful. I love that. Thank you. And I missed, I missed that part. Um, uh, during the testimony, I caught only a couple of pieces. Um, if nobody's watched Cory Booker, oh. uh, when he spoke to her, you must, that's, I, really just, I, I just, I just pasted uh, Cory to Katanji. Um, it was just, just beautiful. I, like, I would wake up and listen to that every morning for a while. It was so inspiring and so beautiful. And, uh, you know, just his saying, I, I'm not going to let anybody steal my joy was, was, was one thing, but he, it was just so rich with so many other things. Uh, in there. So th thanks, Marilee. And, and how we respond to stimuli really matters, like in our lives. And there's plenty of traditions from, you know, Thich Nhat Hanh and, and Buddhism and everything else that, that go very directly and yoga that go really directly into how we respond to stimuli. And that's kind of uh, this moment uh, requires us to dig into those capacities. Um, Eric? Hi, everybody. So I guess this is just a personal experience that I've been going through. And uh, so like since February, I've started getting out a bit more. I joined a gym and uh, I've been you know, exercising more. I've lost weight and all that. So all, all that stuff is a lot for me in addition to, oh, though, I can't listen to the news or whatever. Now, so... Um, I'm starting to see it in other areas of life. Like this past Sunday, after two years of mostly isolation, my synagogue had a huge Purim service. Everybody back in the synagogue dressed up in costumes, uh, not needing masks, it's optional. And uh, it's just shocking that we're, it's all over. Like the mentality, COVID's over. And, but it could come back any time that we know, but still um, adjusting to that state of mind. And then things like, okay, uh, things that were online are now in person, like this event in April where I'm presenting my vintage computers. And uh, so I'm uh, trying to adjust because I did have a benefit of slowing down when COVID started, uh, working from home, adjusting to that, um, not driving everywhere. And um, I'm trying to find the right balance for myself. Now I have <laughs> April's book, I've read a bit of it. Um, there are certain times when I reach something and it's like, uh-oh, <laughs> it's like, uh, I, I, don't, I haven't thought that way. Like, what if I lost everything? Like, how would I handle life? And so it's a challenge. Um, I like that there's a, a roadmap. It's just it, maybe if there was a workbook or a group that, that might help me more, but uh, you, you've hit on a nerve. So thanks. Love that, Eric. Thank you. And, and I think each of us is experiencing moments like that, in particular, like, just last Friday, maybe it was, when I was, because already in, in Portland, masks were optional indoors, but more than the majority of people were still wearing masks. Only a few people were unmasked. And I think last Friday is when I noticed that, that in the places I inhabit, it, it, people were starting to unmask. It was like the masks were coming off and you could suddenly see people's faces. And I wanted to print up t-shirts that said, I, I love seeing your smile you know, and, and, and get those out or something like that. It was, it was transformative and, and concerning in, in the same breath. Stuart, did you want to jump in? No, I was just going to remark on the masks about how slow people are sometimes to change in the sense that, you know, yeah, you can take your masks off, but a lot of people are still wearing masks. And I wondered if it's because of health concerns or if it's just because, um, people get used to and habituated to certain behaviors and they don't change readily. Well, I think, I think partly it's that 
viruses don't turn on and off on a switch. And there's a lot of people watching what's happening with the, you know, the, the Omicron variants that are out. Uh, if, you're, if you live in Hong Kong right this minute, it's just really, really shitty. Like Hong Kong is having, and what's happening is their elders were mostly unvaccinated as opposed to other countries, other islands like New Zealand where their, where their elders were heavily vaccinated. And uh, you know, coronavirus, the latest variant is wiping out the elder population at a, at a dreadful, like a horrifying rate right now, right now. Um, and Pete's wife, Joanne, uh, has her, her eyes and ears and other sensors on those streams and, and keeps up on this kind of thing. So, so unmasking seems premature to people who are seeing those kinds of things happen around the world and are still worried, right? Because everybody's got exhaustion from, from what's going on. Go ahead, Pete. Uh, thanks, Jerry. Um, the, the whole COVID thing is, is super confusing and super weird. Um, uh, from, from my perspective and Joanne's perspective, my wife, uh, we're, we're unmasking way too soon. Um, and society has kind of whiffed it on cleaning air. Uh, we could be sending, so I, you know, sending kids back to school, we should still be wearing masks. Um, and every, every classroom should have a Corsi Rosenthal box, you know, basically. Um, and to do anything else seems crazy. Um, so maybe that's conservative, too conservative or too, too extreme or something like that, but, um, people are still dying. BA2 is ravaging other countries. Uh, some of our experts say that, uh, we had, because of the U S the way we had the BA1 surge, we're not going to really have a BA2 surge, but it's still, uh, a damaging disease and uh, and especially now that we've kind of mostly Hong Kong is people are dying from from COVID BA2 um, uh, since we've mostly kind of like cut down the deaths um, the thing to worry about still is long COVID and uh, it's it's pretty serious it's you know it, it doesn't happen to everybody but it happens to a significant number of folks and so the medical people Joanna and I watch are going okay so you know, we kind of made it through kind of, but we're going to have to adapt our healthcare system to manage long-term, uh, long-term effects of COVID, organ disease, heart disease, vascular disease, um, dementia, all that kind of stuff. So, um, I, <laughs> uh, so take, take it, you know, take it how you will. Joanne and I are going to be wearing masks for a couple more months at least. Um, and I kind of think that it's not really going to even out for a couple of years. And there, there was this that moment last July where there was a week where we were like, oh, good, things are letting up. And then Delta showed up and slammed everybody. But for, for, for just that little moment, everybody looked up and, and thought, oh good, we're gonna be able to relent and, and back out of this thing. And then, you know, two years is a long time. Uh, April has a calendric memory. So she was actually, uh, the last couple of weeks was stepping through her travels just before lockdown two years ago. And today I was here, today I was there, this was happening. And we were both concerned because she had taken a trip to Asia to give some talks and so forth and was on her way back. And in Asia, it was masks everywhere. She was being read, you know, uh, metered at, at the door on her way out of the hotel, back in the hotel, whatever, and uh, came home a bit early because all this was happening. Um, but in that, you know, she hits the airport in, in, in Europe and then in the US and nobody asked her where she's been or how long or there's, there's just like no concern, nothing going on. And just reliving that those moments of, of early uh, of early pandemic were were super interesting and scary. So what do we do with this moment? Shimon, you're a psychologist. What would you recommend for us? I'm actually a psychiatrist. So. Good point. You could <laughs> you could medicate. Are you are you saying we should take pills? Well, if you want to, there's a medication, actually an antidepressant, fluoxetine, fluoxetine, Luvox, that seems to have been beneficial. I'm just listening. I mean, I am sort of like in the same situation. Sometimes too much information is not that good. And yesterday I actually did 
go for a walk with a friend of mine who was a physician. And for the first time, I felt some of the feelings people describe walking someplace not masked because there weren't that many people, but then feeling uncomfortable with it. I check our local county data every morning or a couple of times a week just to see, you know, like the frequency because I agree with what people were talking about before in terms of how the government handled it. And they nationalize everything. And some of the media also like internationalizes the data. But for me, what's important is what's happening locally. And I mentioned I was a psychiatrist because at the beginning of COVID, I was still working in the hospital. So I was rounding on patients, talking to people having, you know, like, neurological and psychiatric side effects of the Medicaid of the COVID before the vaccine. And it was really, really scary. I mean, you know, I would, you know, wear, you know, two, you know, masks and a shit, you know, it, it was pretty scary for a lot of people. And I agree. I mean, a lot of people sort of like burnt out in the hospital setting. Since I've been retired, I've been pretty much uh, following with my wife, staying at home as much as possible. But as I said yesterday, I started going out. For me, actually, what keeps me going, and I agree with what uh, Marilee said in terms of being able to deal with uncertainty, that's sort of like a designation of being healthy. But for me also is being passionate and focused on something. So recently I've been really trying to understand, not, you know, someone mentioned about government, not doing what they're supposed to do, really spending and focusing my time on how to make government function better. In my thinking, the worst thing that we're facing right now is people distrust of government. And I think it's up to everyone who can to try to make government work better. And what I'm doing right now is actually, right this minute actually, is focusing on the CDC. As you know, in 2016, they issued guidelines of opiate use with pain. And it was a very, very corrupt process as a result of which these guidelines got implemented. And there's good evidence that tens of thousands of people may have died as a result of having their medication stopped and winding up with needing to use fentanyl and things of that kind. And now they're the same kind of group within CDC is working on creating new guidelines. So what my interest is as a citizen, how can we get engaged in making government function better? So that's what I'm working on. I'm actually working with Gene Bellinger uh -huh. and we're creating a Kumo map of all the different relationship that led to the COVID, uh, to the, uh, the guidelines, the opiate guidelines and all the different organizations involved, all the research that has been showing the devastation that the guideline caused. And talking about COVID, in, 20, in 2020, right when the pandemic was starting in Asia, I started tracking what the CDC was doing. And as a matter of fact, in January of 2020, the CDC had a series of press conferences talking about COVID. And what intrigues me is why did the media not continue following that, you know, uh, what seems to me to be a very important issue or problem, why didn't they follow up on it until essentially March 23rd, which now essentially is two years exactly to the date where everyone started freaking out, where hospitals knew about it, you know, like, agencies knew about it in January. So what was it about that period of time and what was it about the media that did not allow us to get ready for it a lot sooner? So that's what I'm working on. So it just gives me purpose. I don't focus so much on the immediacy of whether I can get COVID or not, but give me direction. Yeah, thank you, Shimon. Thanks a lot. And I wanna use uh, some of what you said to kind of tip us forward into, I guess, optimism, which is 
I, I, part part of this funny moment we're in feels like a moment of of dramatic sort of melting and reshaping of the institutions, the assumptions, the the spirit of the moment. A, a, a series of different things I think are very plastic right now, and very reshapeable. And I'm wondering um, how we might take advantage of this, or if any of us are, are approaching this moment in that spirit of, hey, um, there's you know there's trust has been undermined intentionally for the last decade hard before that also, but for the last decade, it's become a major weapon in the arsenal of political parties. Trust in science, trust in journalism, trust in elections, trust in the other, uh, trust in almost like civilization itself. Um, and so we've had an interesting chat here in the chat about you know government, who needs government, Gov government's gotta be fixed, uh, all of that. Trust in government has been actively undermined, and the CDC early on did things that were not that trustworthy and not really didn't really help you know help the situation much at all. So, um, who's leaning in, and and what does that mean? I want to insert something, um, please. So I really love the question: How do we live in this moment? Because it takes into account what do we do in this moment, but more fundamentally, who do we be? in this moment. And I think we all have a need and a responsibility for managing ourselves, managing our state, managing our mindsets, managing who we're being, because out of that, everything else grows. And the cool thing about that is um, we all have agency over ourselves. So if we begin standing there, then who we be and what we do and how we take in and consume and put out changes everything. Um, and Stuart will know, cause he's working on a project with me on thoughtful citizenship. Mm. And the basis, I mean, the beginning of it is um, managing yourself so that you can manage to be in even very difficult conversations and situations and still hold your center. Because without that, nothing we do is gonna hold up over or endure. So I throw that on the table for conversation. I love that. Uh, there's also uh, the Inquiry Institute has put out something on thoughtful citizenship. Do you know about, that? oh, that's you, that's right. That's, uh, I'm just discovering that in my brain, rediscovering it, thank you. Uh, Stuart, over to you also a BK author. Yeah, um, I, I, I just wanted to mention that, um, you know, punctuate that it all starts with the individual. Um, even in Neil Davidson's um, uh, proposal yesterday or offering yesterday, you know, he, he articulated that it starts with the individual. But um, the first thought I had, Jerry, when you mentioned the word optimism was, you know, we need to define that. What do we mean by optimism? optimistic that everything is going to turn out all fine and we're going to uh, go back to the way it was before all of the, the global issues. No, the optimism for me is that um, it's, a, it's, a, it's a great time of learning. And as we all know, learning, um, it, learning creates endorphins in the system. And so, you know, we're learning our way through how to be different in this world, how to remake institutions and how to reorganize society. So in some sense, it's, a, it's an absolutely wonderful um, opportunity for, for those of us that continue to live. Uh, and, and living may be very, very different as we move into the future. My internet was completely down for you know, 24 hours, at, including my cable TV, all right? And I was just starting to relish the quiet when they fixed it. <laughs> it was just an unbelievably and wonderful meditational state, and then they fixed it. <laughs> Darn it. And you could turn it off, Stuart. <laughs> yeah, but we don't. We don't. We keep our hand off that knob. Right. Um, thanks, Stuart. Uh, Doug? I'm wondering if the focus on the individual is part of the too much focus on the individual problem that we have in Western civilization. Uh, we're not putting the effort into learning about our institutions. We're not putting the effort into understanding the history that brings us to this moment. Uh, as a concrete example, uh, 
the stuff that's going on between Russia and the Ukraine has a history. Uh, for example, there was a coup in the Ukraine in 2014 that took out a pro-Soviet government that had been elected and put in a kind of fake government sponsored by the US. Almost nobody seems to know that history. Uh, and it just points to the fact that, you know, as an individual, that's not a very strong leverage point for how society works. I think we have to be careful. It's not an either or at all. Yeah, I was hearing or. <laughs> no, definitely not. It's really, how, who do I be such that I can do and contribute and think as broadly as possible and then choose some leveraged actions with whomever? Just, just to add to, um, to Doug's historical fact about Ukraine and Russia, I remember reading that at some moment in time uh, around 2014, Russia wanted to join NATO and it was rejected. Um, yeah. Well, that's interesting. Um, anybody who runs deep on, on sort of uh, Ukraine, Belarus, Russia on these topics, because I thought Yanukovych was put in power and he was a Russian puppet. Uh, and he had been pushed out by the Euromaidan uh, protests and the Ukrainian revolution. Uh, so I have a slightly different understanding of, of how those things went down. Um, let's go Gil, Klaus, and back to Doug. So it's hey, before you go, I'm trying to get my hand down and it's not taking on when I click on lower the hand. Ah, uh, you know what? Uh, this is, oh, you got it done. I was about okay. to lower, because I'm the host, I can lower your hand, but you found it. Thanks. <laughs> uh, Klaus, I think it's you. No, it's me. Oh, good. It's Gil. Yeah, you took your hand down. Yeah. Um, so it's complicated kids you know <laughs> it's not either or and we're and we're wired to either or black white good bad this that uh, and in particular our mediators have a very hard time dealing with complexity where there's you know pluses and minuses on both sides of the story uh, and if you follow the ukraine story over the course of a month or a year or eight years or 10 years or 30 years or 100 years you get very different stories um, there's a, a lovely animated map on YouTube, um, sorry, showing the uh, um, European boundaries over the last thousand years. And I really encourage people to have a look at it because it's like, it's not the picture that we grew up with. It's not the last 70, we're in a 70 year, very anomalous period in human history that, we, you know, that we're coming to the end of here. And it's not like it's been, um, there was a period when the Lithuania empire was bigger than Russia. You know, little tiny pipsqueak Baltic state Lithuania uh, encompassed, uh, you know, uh, most of Poland, chunks of Russia, ch you know, chunks of the Austro-Hungarian Empire, chunks of Romania. These things are very, have, have been very malleable. And so what is national identity in the face of this? It's a big question. Um, um, you may remember there was a, Putin gave a speech a couple of weeks ago and the basic coverage in the Western press or in the American press at least was this was a deranged speech. And if you read it, it's not deranged. I mean, it's, I think it's deeply wrong and dangerous and bad in many ways, but it's coherent. It reflects a geopolitical historical analysis um, that has some grounding, uh, 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 see Peter Zion on the geopolitics of a, uh, Europe and Asia and Central Asia. Um, see Alexander Dugin as the kind of source point for a lot of Putin's perspective on Russian empire and Russian identity. Point being is that you can't, you can't win by just demonizing your enemy. You have to understand your enemy. Uh, you know, the military leaders deeply understand that. Political leaders and certainly and even less media leaders seem to not. Uh, so, um, um, you know, George Kennan, who was the architect of the U.S. containment policy, said in, I think, 1997 that uh, pushing NATO eastward is a huge error. Dangerous, provocative, don't do this. This is a guy who is not a fan of the Soviet Union or Russia. This is, of course, after Soviet Union. Um, uh, William Perry, who was the Secretary of Defense under Clinton in the 90s, uh, apparently was close to resigning over U.S. and NATO 
expansion policy because of the strategic dangers of that. So, you know, there are reasons that uh, Putin could be upset given his understanding of, of, of Russian security concerns. You, you, you stand in the Kremlin and look west and there are no natural barriers for hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of miles. Uh, it's an indefensible Western border. On the other hand, Putin is operating off of this, this you know, historically constructed fantasy of Russian empire, Russian identity of the Russian empire. Uh, uh, so here we are. And, and the, you know, where, this, where this comes down to real life challenge, which you, which you see every day, is that NATO and the United States are grappling with what are the defenses against this guy that do not trigger him into nuclear escalation. And it's, you know, it's, it's one of those things that makes me glad that I'm not in political leadership because I don't know how you deal with that question. Mm -hmm. It's an incalculable risk uh, with enormous consequences and we're right in the middle of that one. And so many of the narratives, like some of the ones you just, you just put on the table dictate action or create this sort of web of assumptions and this whole idea of nato membership is one of them and i a couple of days ago i watched uh, lithuania's president or premier uh basically say hey vladimir you should ask yourself why all these border countries want to join nato mm -hmm. like want to have been trying to join nato like you should really ask yourself because we don't trust you you are a kleptocracy we don't want to be drawn into your circle kind of thing and then Half the people in these countries would have voted otherwise and would have, you know, faced east. So it's it's really really complicated. Yeah, um, and in, and in the in the you know media political oversimplification environment that we live in, you have Republicans yelling at Biden for why aren't you more aggressive against Putin? Of course, you know, a month ago they were in favor of Putin, but that's you know water under the bridge. Uh, so it's easy to posture, but um, you know, I would love to see a no-fly zone to keep Russian planes out of there. But if a no-fly zone triggers a nuclear exchange. You know, I'm shopping for, I, I, I periodically think about if I should shop for iodine pills. Just, you know, small investment at a small amount of risk mitigation on a very unlikely possibility. But where else do I have agency in this thing? Well, I think the, uh, the use by date on iodine pills is probably pretty far away. So you might as well buy a couple, right? Yeah. yeah. It's not like they're going to age out on your shelf. Yeah. Um, Klaus, then Stuart. Yeah, the uh, Deutsche Welle, you know, the German podcasting system is putting in some some pretty uh, solid reporting. I, I posted uh, a uh, documentary there, which they developed of war unfolding the struggle for Ukraine that has a historic perspective of what is happening here, that relationship uh, and how Russians think, how Ukrainians think about their relationship. But there's one episode um, that really hit home with me. It was a, uh, a young couple, uh, really sort of an upper middle class, uh, 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 smart looking people, um, husband, wife, maybe in their 30s, having a child in their arms. And they had to separate at the border. You know, they were on their way, they were at the Polish border and uh, men uh, between 18 and 60 are not allowed to leave. They have to go and uh, take up arms. And you could see the shock on their faces. They were completely shocked, right? Because they, were, they got ripped out of a world that we live in. And all of a sudden there was a bomb that ripped their building apart and their condominium that they had saved up for and, and uh, able to you know, establish sort of an upper middle class uh, lifestyle was gone, was gone, had vanished. And they had to split up. So the wife and the child, you know, the baby, had to, had, had to leave, they had to separate and he had to turn around, go back and join the military. And you could see how traumatized they were. And so that actually hit me because I've been traumatized for years since I started looking when my, my, my first experience 10 years ago. You know, I, I took a course on uh, university uh, on, on Coursera introduction to sustainability. And I actually wrote an, uh, uh, an article that I got invited by the professor later into a round table discussion, are we insane? Because you look at this data, you know, I mean, it's just it's just ridiculously easy to understand where these trend lines are heading. 
So we are on a trajectory, right, that leads us into a destination where we don't want to be. I mean, it's just so obvious, right? And you can't get it across. So to me, that was that was like this bomb just ripped the, 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 my place apart. And I'm in shock, right? And I've been in shock for 10 years uh, uh, trying to figure out where, where you go with this. But that's really, you know, I think what is happening to us is that the, the environmental catastrophe that is unfolding around us is a slow motion thing and we can't come to grips with it. I mean, anybody living in the Ukraine being encircled by the Russian army, right, uh, should have raised some alarms. I mean, clearly, you know, a cost, I mean, a lot of people, in fact, my son is, uh, was working for Grammarly, which is uh, their programming team is located in the Ukraine. They pulled all their people out you know, three weeks before anything happened and transferred them into Poland because how can you accept this kind of risk? Right? So, so it's this, how can we tolerate this kind of risk and pretend everything is normal? It's not normal. You know, th this time we are living in is not normal. And we are heading into a future that if we stay on this trajectory, it's going to be tragic. Yeah. You're muted, Jerry. I just noticed that. Newbie mistake, sorry. Um, thank you, Klaus. I really appreciate that. Um, and it was muted because I went to follow the link to the video that Klaus had put earlier in the chat and muted myself so it wouldn't play. And then I forgot. So there we are. <clears throat> um, Stuart, then Ingrid. Yeah, I just wanted to pick up on, on, on something that Gil said about, um, you know, the edge of, um, uh, of not uh, precipitating a nuclear war <laughs> if you're in the di diplomatic uh, core. Um, and, and what that raises for me uh, on, on the other side is, you know, how long do we let ourselves be held hostage by someone who's acting in a way that's just totally unhousebroken in terms of human civilization, you know, exemplified by the story that Klaus just told. Um, it also shows that we've got, you know, these, these international institutions that have no teeth, um, the International Criminal Court in the United Nations. Um, just again, raising the need uh, that after, you know, because at some time this will be a solution. It, it may be, it may be um, a Dr. Strangelove solution. We don't, we, don't, we don't know that. You know, we're talking about iodine pills in this conversation. Um, and here we are in a, in a <laughs> to quote a phrase, in an extraordinary state of flux. <laughs> aren't we <laughs> aren't we exactly uh, and and there's a mental there's a big difference between iodine pills and where will we hide and gosh there's a moment here where we could reinvent governance and mutual aid and wealth as grace put in front of us a couple months ago and a bunch of other things and and some people are working full-time on, on those sorts of efforts um, Ingrid. Well, you know, it's interesting um, when everyone is talking about the situation we're in right now with um, and why it happened, whether it was NATO encroaching or some kind of diplomatic issue or um, a puppet government not being in Ukraine. And I would just like to add that um, from my very small anecdotal sampling of living in Estonia, that I feel like right now the biggest thing is that Russia has realized that the economies around it are an existential threat to Russia because Ukraine had an incredible tech industry um, plowing ahead as entrepreneurial as any other country I've seen. Um, you have Estonia, Latvia, the Baltics, you know, with this incredible economic machine that makes Russia look like, you know, something out of the dark ages. Um, there is there is an entrepreneurial scene in Russia as well, but it's not um, in the typical Western model for the most part. So I think I'm not sure that um, it was necessarily, um, you know, anything that um, we could have prevented in some ways because the way Russia saw that this encroachment of economic um, 
you know, prosperity in these countries, these former Soviet republics, really is just a threat to them, to the way he runs his country, right? And so, you know, how do we deal with that? Because the new world order, what I see is that Russia is the 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 way that he runs it is a, is an old model that no longer works, and it's a last grab to say, hey, we still have some relevance in this new world order and he does not anymore whether this is the last gasp we don't know he could still have another few chapters to eke out this horrible thing or mm -hmm. this could be the end of it and i hope it is it, it, it so yeah what do we do at this stage we can't stop you know this pressure this all these pressures on on russia because the world is changing and 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 that's going away even China's got a model now where they have a middle class and they're part of the world more than Russia. And China's in, in such a, China's in such a weird position right now. I mean, well, really. With what's going on there with the pandemic and the way they're locking down, that's a whole nother thing that's messed up their model. But anyway, those were just some of my thoughts as I was listening to people. Yeah, thank you. And and if you're Latvia, Lithuania, Estonia, you are worried sick about all this um, because there's a giant power that formerly looked really formidable was parked right next door. Um, uh, Doug. The economy that you describe on the uh, western edge of the, Russia is the same economy that's causing the problems with climate change. Uh, it's high energy, high uh, push through uh, and creating inequality. So the, the nexus of problems that we're in is just incredibly complex. I think efforts to try and change one thing at a time fail because as soon as you try and change one thing, you run up against all the others. Uh, in that kind of existential moment, what do you do? My own feeling is actually things have to fall apart a little bit more before they can be put back together. And that means society going through an extremely painful phase. And the question is how far do things have to fall apart before they reshape? Um, that's the question about climate change. It's like how much destruction needs to happen before people actually pick up an act is, to, you know, do we have to lose large chunks of, of place or population or food systems before people will treat it as more of an emergency? And, and we're facing a whole series of emergencies concurrently right now. But that's a conundrum, you know, because, uh -huh. because climate change uh, functions in, in, in form of tipping points. And once you once you cross that tipping point, there's no going back. You know, so for, so for example, when you go online, you look at the doomsday glacier. You know, uh, uh, that's a that's a real thing. You know, this this glacier could actually collapse within the next five six. It's projected to collapse within the next five to six years. If that happens, all bets are off because the introduction of so much fresh water into the Gulf Stream circulatory system could bring that to a halt and dramatically change the global climate system. So there, there are risk factors out there where you, know, you wait for all of that to happen and then act, it's done, it's too late. And this is the unique challenge that we have now is to be able to, to work in, in an anticipatory stance, right? That's, and we have never been able as a species, we have never been able to do that. And, and so there is, there is no answer that I would have for that. Yeah, as is, as has happened a number of times in this conversation, people are pulling at both ends. I think it's all going on at the same time. <clears throat> and that's why the conditioning of the human being to be able to navigate uh, in this context is going to be so important. Otherwise, uh, we will all as individuals and, and as a social system um, implode into a dystopian um, context. Just a, a comment on climate. I think we ought to all systematically start saying climate crisis rather than climate change because the word change kinds of lulls us into like april was talking oh change no it's not that um and also i'd like to bring in what is the role of disinformation and then behind that who is doing it with what kind of thinking 
and for what purposes because th that's a lot what's keeping people in in the the um kind of fake comfort <laughs> one of the things that i'm marveling at is how good Putin and Sirkin and his lieutenants and his fear were at misinformation, like really like world class. And there's a thought in my brain that says we are already in a nonlinear war, which is stimulated by a documentary called Hypernormalization that Adam Curtis uh, did back in 2016. And I watched Hypernormalization and Adam Curtis has lots of editorial commentary. He feels very strongly about things, but he's a BBC documentarian who finds really interesting footage in BBC archives around the world. And he assembled this story that that was plausible to me that that hey world war three is already happening it's a it's an it's a it's a psychological war because nonlinear war is cheaper than bullets and bombs and that's a thought i'd had years ago and that putin has just lived out uh counterintuitively because he's now expending bullets bombs and lives at a rate that is shocking that's with amazing. no forward progress and when and how did how did somebody who's such a master of, uh, of nonlinear war and misinformation and fuck this up so royally? Like, like really, how did how did it happen so badly? Um, and so one of the sources of, of misinformation is there, but there's plenty of others because this art of uh, flooding the zone, there's a, a bunch of terms for this, uh, has been passed around. There's, there's a lot of people who've learned how to do this professionally. There's all, like little sub-industries to, to manage to to create impressions or do grasp. It even goes back to sort of gra fake, um, what's it called, um, astroturfing, you know, fake grassroots. Uh, so grassroots things are, are interesting. We love grassroots movements. So people learned how to astroturf, which was fake grassroots movements. That goes back to consumer mass marketing in the you know web 2.0 era. That was a, a common thing. So all these things are kind of related. Their technologies are related, um, all those kinds of things. Anybody else on misinformation, uh, malinformation, disinformation, and its role? Uh, can, I, <clears throat> can I throw in one last word about this? Ingrid was pointing out that Putin is caught in a previous time and he's fighting the war from a previous time. I've noticed that militarily, he's likewise doing things that come from a previous time. I guess that, that's what he grew up with and that's what he thinks is still effective. And what I don't know. I think he's also suffering, uh, this is just superficial from reading what's what's out there, but I think he's also suffering from the kleptocracy and corruption that he sprouted as a country, because for example, they developed encrypted radio communication devices that failed, that just failed. So their people in the field don't have protected communications. They're busy using cell phones, using whatever the hell they can to, to talk. And we're getting these recordings that, that are embarrassing, to, you know, uh, that are humiliating, actually, uh, in isn't, different ways. Isn't he exposing how weak they really are? This war should not be going this way if, and under any circumstance. Absolutely. Unbelievably uh, vulnerable is what they're showing. It's, it's, it's crazy. It's crazy because this was a power that everybody feared that has suddenly <laughs> been shown to be naked and, and, and vulnerable, which is super interesting. Um, and, you know, and this may be why that um, we end up in a nuclear war, because he cannot lose. He cannot lose in terms of his own psyche. There's no, there is no exit ramp, I don't think. And so um, that's why I, I find my own thinking going to, um, uh, you know, uh, uh, going on the attack, which is just crazy making for me that 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 this is where my mindset is going uh, preemptive strikes and things like that i even was doing some research about the different scenarios and how they might play out which is just i i can't believe it it's an of my entire life's work <laughs> and here we are and here we are i know uh, mike i'm, I'm you have uh, julian uh, see you you have to go, you have to bounce i think Mike, I'm sorry that you have your own call parallel to the last hour we had because we could have used you. Mike is at the Carnegie Endowment for World Peace. Um, uh, and we've been sort of- Growth industry right now. Growth industry, job-, job. Fighting for international peace. There's, there's no, no, no lack of a need for it. Exactly. But yeah, I'm sorry I missed the fun. I, I can catch up later. 
That's that's all right. Thank you, um, Gil. Yeah, I would I would recommend. I mean, this is self promotion or promotion of our organization, but some of the content that my colleagues around the world have been publishing on Ukraine and particularly the ripple effects, you know, how it's being seen in other parts of the world and what the impacts could be when food prices go through the roof. There's a lot of really good stuff coming out of Carnegie Endowment. So are there CEIP.org. Are there particular individuals you recommend? Can, can you sort of feed a couple things into the chat? I'll of, do a couple. Yeah the, yeah, the nuclear folks are some of the best in the world. And so um, that's something that would be very interesting. Uh, the analysis of what China is trying to do as they try to, you know, kind of go between the U.S. And, and Russia and then the Indians as well. This is all, it's all fascinating. But I'll put a few things out. Love that. Thank you. Uh, Gil? Yeah, thanks. Um, 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 Putin naked, Jerry, he's only partly naked. He's still got more nukes than anybody. Mm -hmm. And we suspect a willingness to use them. So there's that. Stuart, Stuart shit changes, huh? <laughs> <laughs> you know, I mean, but this, is like, this, is, this, is, this is meta and important to this conversation because you talk about, you know, the, I forget your exact words, but the, you know, the, the way that you've lived your entire life, the values and concerns that you've lived your entire life. And we are all of a sudden in a very different set of concerns with very different perspectives and parameters. I mean, I grew up, you know, I remember standing with my dad in 1962 in Times Square calling for nuclear disarmament. You know, I grew up under that shadow thought it was over. Uh -uh. Here we go. The thing about authoritarianism, Ingrid, I like the thought that it's on the run, but it looks like it's also not on the run. Um, because many folks, including G and MBS and others, see this as a confrontation of authoritarianism and democracy, which they will argue is a more effective and efficient system. I think what this displays, in addition to the kleptocracy that Jerry was talking about, is the, is the fundamental cybernetic defect of authoritarian systems. So they lack requisite variety. You know, they can't get enough information, timely and accurate information, because if you bring bad news to the king, you get your tongue cut out or your head cut off. And so Putin, for whatever his own psychological makeup is, is in an information bubble of his own construction. That, you know, is maybe one of the factors that drives bad military strategy. Uh, you need diversity, not as a matter of justice and dignity, but for requisite variety in decision making. And it's interesting, you remove trust from the equation, as Putin has systematically been doing from the government, right. as he suspects right. everybody, and you destroy all the needed channels for innovation, communication, coordination, everything else, like, like they just go away. Yeah, you know, you and April could do a whole series of books with single word titles. Sounds good. Um, Doug, then Eric. Eric, it's nice to see you. I find myself trying to think about the history of how we got here. And I'm drawn to the fact that we live uh, on the hockey stick that went with population and energy feeding off of each other, creating a much larger population. So that's a cause background. But the interesting question to me is what was the culture that led to the hockey stick? And is that culture still operative and still causing our problems? Can you say more about that, please? Well, uh, humanity actually did pretty well living on the surface of the earth uh, until it moved towards coal and oil. And uh, the history of that's pretty complicated as to why that happened. Uh, one view is that it was economic efficiency, but another view is that shifting to coal uh, made it easier for corporations to move around and control their workers. Uh, that's a really interesting idea. Well, I don't know. I just think that, that the, the culture that we're in, which is fairly materialistic, coming probably from the Greeks, is part of our problem. Uh, we know much more about things than we do about people. And it's causing us tremendous problems because you try and maximize around things and not maximize around people and you get the kind of culture that we're in. Thanks, Doug. Um, in Against the Grain, James Scott, it's a brilliant book. It's kind of like a precursor to the dawn of everything. I love it, yep. 
and against the grain is fabulous. And he basically says, uh, why are grains so important around the world? They're not as like potatoes are more nutritious than grains. Uh, why are grains important? A, they uh, ripen at the same time. So we have harvest festivals. They grow above ground. So you can tell who's growing it and how much is growing it. They store well and they're very transportable with some minimal loss to rodents and, and rot uh, taxes. Basically, uh, civilized humans who were cooked in, in China, they talked about the cooked and uncooked uh, people. The cooked were the ones they civilized into cities. Uh, civilized people could then be taxed and the whole thing then works out really well. So, so then it turns out that people who were dependent on grains and eating mostly grain-based diets inside the cities had vitamin deficiencies and nutritional deficiencies and their skeletons look worse than the people who were outside eating a variety of things because they understood the landscape. And so there's, there's lots of really, really interesting uh, uh, writings and thinkings about the transition from the, the old way of being into some new industrial or other way or, or agricultural way of being, you know, civilization in air quotes, um, all of which feeds our beliefs today about what's possible, what we want to try to do, what, what a new optimal system might look like, et cetera, et cetera. Because if we think that life used to be nasty, brutish, and short, and we were all starving and hungry on the tundra and fighting each other all the time, then there's nothing we can learn from that era that matters. If we don't think that, there's possibly a lot we can learn from and we can question ourselves, why did we let coal and, and grain sort of shift our world so dramatically? And in what ways can we mitigate, change, do whatever? Uh, anyway, these are, these are juicy, lovely, complicated issues that, that are relevant because they form this background sort of set of forces that influence all of us in our choices about what to believe, what not to believe, what to try to do. Um, Eric. Yeah, I was looking for some some. Uh, it's, it's a slide from a TED talk. Uh, I will show it later because it's too good not to show directly. <laughs> and it's about dictatorship. Um, I um, there's so many layers like uh, the the whole escalation towards um, nuclear war. I don't know. He's a bit off uh, Putin, so he might do weird things. He's backed in a corner, that's true. But he's also a very tactical person. And the only reason why he would use um, nuclear war is if he doesn't want to admit that he's won and he wants to lose then everything, including all human life. So in that case, it doesn't make sense for him to do it. He wants to win, he wants to stay in power. He wants to stay in his position and he uses these nuclear arms as a strong arm thing. He, he strong arms everyone into submission not to get involved in the war in Ukraine. That's a very tactical way and a very successful way for him to do that. And the fact that nobody can read him is maybe also a very good tactic from his end. Um, he has been isolated. He's, his circle of imp, of uh, um, advisors advisors has shrunk. Uh, that's actually what was also on the slide. It's like a woman talking about dictatorship all over the world, and one is that there's psychopaths, uh, people talking the truth for him that as he wants to hear it, and then giving him the lies that made him made make wrong decisions that he made now. So he's basically a personalized dictator, uh, personalized, personal, yeah, I don't know. But he, I think from his position, it's weird to imagine how he can think now and what he can still do, but I think he will do everything he can to still steer towards winning somehow. And unless he's, re and he is backed into a corner, like he, ca he can't control the information, uh, indefinitely right now it's still 80 percent or something of, of the population that believe in him or something but that's difficult to read statistics but once that information bubble is going to burst that's maybe when we have to start getting worried <laughs> i guess um before that i don't think it's a wise decision for him tactically but if he's completely losing his mind maybe he does something completely irrational yeah but then still it's a chain of command that still has to follow. And then 
I've read somewhere that it's like a 50 50 chance if people follow through an action like that like there was a russian guy who stopped us in nuclear war uh, before he made a decision by himself uh, saying no to a to a decision in command and it's, yeah it's weird to read into that um but also and yet another part is how cynical is this war um that, that's a question it's not a statement it's it's a question and i saw this debate on how much responsibility does nato have how much responsibility does the us have and of course it's all about those proxy wars and how Afghanistan, Vietnam, that those kind of wars were examples also for, for Putin to say like, yeah, US, once, once a country joins NATO, they put a lot of missiles uh, in that country. And then th that's actually true. The US is everywhere. It's also around China. Every country around China has missile bases. So he has a point there. From his perspective, I can understand that he feels threatened. Um, there was no reason to invade Ukraine as far as we know right now, because Ukraine would have not joined the NATO soon. And now they're sure to join the NATO. So that's how we... I'm not, sure that, I'm, not sure that def, I'm not sure they're definitely going to join. That's I think that's one of the negotiating chips on the table, should there be a peace agreement. It's like... Yeah, permanent. okay. No, yeah, yeah, true. But Finland yeah. is joining <laughs> and uh, Sweden is joining. I think that there's like 20 things that happened that are the opposite of what Putin expected to happen. Yeah, his, yeah. his misread Putin on the situation. Putin doesn't care about NATO. Putin cares about a successful, prospering democracy right over the border. That's what he cares about. Yeah. And having major, people watch problem? that develop. It's the same reason he's, he's squashed Belarus. I mean, he doesn't, and Tajikistan, he, I mean, not Tajikistan, Kazakhstan. What makes you, but what makes you say that he doesn't care about NATO? That's not his. I mean, that's not his negotiation. That's not what he really wants. We could give him know that everything that's he wants on NATO. So these are all different perspectives yeah. on the problem. Which, and, and I'm really happy yeah. to, have, to have various perspectives on the problem. And, and also, I'll, I'll I'll add a note, which is um, we talked a little bit about Alexander Dugin, and there's this whole thing called Eurasianism, uh, which is like Mother Russia and all that. And it could be that that's all just cover talk. Right, that, that it, it could be that the narrative of reestablishing Mother Russia and Eurasianism makes a really nice cover for, hey, I can't actually have a functional democracy next door. I need to find an excuse to go attack them. And, and whether these things are, or it could be that he's actually been, you know, I find it very funny that Putin is like the last syllable in Rasputin. Anybody <laughs> remember Rasputin? Yes. Uh, yeah. Like, isn't that weird? I find that really kind of scary weird. Um, and the other so, thing to not discount is the importance of the Orthodox Church. Which is where, which is kind of what I'm folding in here, which is like maybe his brain was eaten Rasputin style by this mythical Mother Russia. Uh, the, the Kievan Rus are the birthplace of the Russian sort of people and ethos, and Kievan is from Kiev. Uh, right. so, so, so this is the, the, beating heart, the beating heart of Mother Russia kind of beats in, in, in Ukraine in some strange way. Yeah, but then it goes back to Viking warlords who seeded the Kievan Rus. So the, exactly. trail, the trail is crazy. Oh, true. But the, the reason why I think he believes his own craziness is also because that's a, a general thing what dictators do in their personalized role, but also because of the weirdness of the things that he does. Like he had this show where um, on television, there was an, uh, he was in this shirtless on, on top of a horse. <laughs> right, right, right. <laughs> Being uh, shirtless and it looks so weird, but that only makes sense if he really believes that he is this kind of hero that carries the that carries his his country forward. Otherwise, why do that? Do that crazy thing. <laughs> I know. Yeah. We, we and yeah, I'll, I'll shut up there because there's plenty more I can say. But <laughs> yeah. But Mike, I I am interested by your point, but you bring it with a certainty that I I don't I don't think you can really know that for sure. And, and, unless, unless he, unless he really is convinced he's losing, and and he is now hiring execution squads to go out and kill deserters from the Russian army. He's actually sending in people who, take the check, who will kill the deserters and make sure that everybody stays in, in in line. But as I say, the only way 
he would care about NATO is if he realizes he's, he's losing and as a negotiation ploy, he says, oh, okay, well, if you that way care. don't yeah, and that way care NATO, about fine. Yeah. But his real objective doesn't have to do with NATO. And, and, and if, if, if he's still moving yeah. in huh. and, and NATO and the US and everybody said, okay, well, we, we guarantee in blood, we're gonna sign this, we'll never let Ukraine in NATO, he would still keep moving. As long as he has the advantage, he's going to keep Mike, moving. Mike, what he what, wants what, to crush democracy and and the economy of Ukraine. Mike, what's your sense of the most likely endgame? In t this morning, you know, like right now, yeah, right yeah. Now, tomorrow. Syria. Mm -hmm. Ooh. Yeah. Say more. It turns into Same Syria, Aleppo. Out, you know, five more cities turn to dust, like Aleppo and Grozny. Mm -hmm. Oh. But a, that's not that's not end game. That's interim. Then what? Because Syria's not done. Syria is not an in, is in is it's Syria yeah. is still doing it. There there's some analysts who say that um, despite the media coverage that talks about you know indiscriminate Russian bombing, the Russian air force has actually been very much held back in reserve. The bombing is much more selective. It's ugly, and worse in Mariupol than in other places. But not the vastness. Oh. It's not carpet bombing like they did in Aleppo. Or no, it's in, not. In no. Grozny. The, the the thing though is that the 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 artillery, which is less accurate, yeah, and and I mean it's, yeah it's very clear that they're not knocking out the electric grid. They I mean, the internet. They need the, they need the cellular system because otherwise they can't communicate. Well, mm -hmm. but but you know if they really wanted to have total war, they would at least make sure there's no water and no electricity to large parts of the of of the country. And the mm -hmm. fact that they haven't done cyber attacks. Mm -hmm. which could have done that without weaponry is yeah. an indication so, that they, they thought they were going to waltz in and take over. They didn't want to have to rebuild everything because that's mm -hmm. expensive. They've already done a hundred billion dollars in damage or more, but I, I agree, but, but they are definitely targeting civilians, but it's, it's so, a terrorism so, ploy. It's a terrorism. terrorism. But Mike, yeah. if, you see, if you see the end game as Aleppo, then you see that NATO is not going to do anything to stop them. Is that what you're saying? Unless he starts using chemical weapons or biological weapons. Yeah. I mean, and then, and there, then there is a possibility of a humanitarian uh, no-fly zone. Mm -hmm. There could be something where they say, okay, guys, you know, there's large parts of the country that are now uh, running out of food. Mm -hmm. And particularly medicine. I mean, that's Putin is going to kill tens of thousands of Ukrainians who are, you know, seniors dependent upon insulin. I mean, that, that's happened already. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, so, um, so at some level, you've got a madman on the loose. You've got a madman on the loose. If if you've got someone acting like that in a in a in a state in a city in the U.S., <clears throat> you go pick them up and you lock them up. Or we, or, we vote him in, or we vote them into office. <laughs> <laughs> either, either, either one of those. And that's, that's the absurdity of this situation in some way. And, and the way he's just holding everyone hostage because of the nuclear threat. Mm -hmm. Well, um, it, he may not be mad. Um, there is the mad <laughs> school of diplomacy. I mean, and Nixon did this. Nixon would yep, make, yep. make sure that the Russians overheard him telling Kissinger, you know, it's just time that we nuke Hanoi. And suddenly the Russian intelligence services would tell their friends in Moscow, who would tell their friends in Hanoi, that the president is totally bonkers. You'd better be a little more flexible at the negotiating table. Yeah. But just to kill X number of people, the way he's doing that, in my lexicon, there is a madman loose. Okay. I mean, he's, <laughs> and I think it, it, it's an, an evil, cruel person who has done this in Georgia, in Chechnya, in Syria, and is yes. now playing the same playbook. But again, mad or, in, mad or evil. I mean, you take take your choice. Yeah, mad's an interpretation. That, you know, clearly he's a bully. And what do you do with the bully? You, you know, you let the bully bully you, and you let the bully bully you. And at some point, you say, "I'm going to stop the bully from bullying me." Which, is, <clears throat> you, unless somebody stops the bully, the bully keeps on bullying. But there is a risk because the bully may, you know, may beat you. Well, the best thing you do is you uh, really somehow harm the bully's friends and supporters. Which we're doing. 
so very well. We're not I mean, doing enough to Belarus, though. I mean, that's that's where we really or, need or, to or China, which we can't. Well, China's so, not China's China's really trying to walk between. I mean, they they aren't <laughs> sending weapons in. So hold on a, a second. Good, that's, that's a good lesson that if China. I'm oh, sorry. <laughs> yes, sir. Thank you. Um, Ingrid was trying to step in a little earlier, and then I'd love to take our last couple minutes uh, to look up a little bit <clears throat> and to step out of the, the is he a lunatic and what's he going to do next into uh, what the opportunities are. And we're almost at the end of our call. And Ingrid, I might have misinterpreted. I thought I saw you wanting to step in. I did just want to quickly say that what he's doing is he's holding all of the civilians hostage there and they're starving to death and no one's doing anything because if NATO intervenes, does no fly or anything, we're in a world war. So that can't be done unless there is some attack on a NATO country or a missile over fire. So we're really in a predicament where it's difficult to do a lot of things. Yeah. That's I appreciate all. that a lot. Yeah. Um, so let's take a breath. And we have only a few minutes left in our, in our time together. Uh, and anybody who would like to offer something forward looking, please step in. Or if you have a poem you'd like to read or anything else. I was going to say, watch Dr. Strangelove tonight. <laughs> Enjoy it. <laughs> um, a few of us are starting a reading circle for Dawn of Everything. I put a couple oh. links in, in the chat. I want to do that. Um, not a poem, Jerry, but I posted this in the chat a little while back um, from Srini Sargadatta Maharaj, who said, all that happens is the cause of all that happens. Causes are numberless. The idea of a sole cause is an illusion. And I, I find somehow, I don't know why I find some comfort in that in these days. It's interesting. And we've been, we've been having lots of conversations about sense making and how that works, which we'll get back to. Um, but I find, I find that moving the potential causes and forces around in my head and in places and, and you know on documents is really useful just to sort out oh wait a minute you know th this whole train of thought is really huge and i've been forgetting about it you know, like, like what mike put on the table which is putin just doesn't want you know a healthy democracy next door that, that's interesting to me to 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 have those things in play yes. I'm, I'm of the mind that we need to decentralize the economy as much as possible and, and convey local control. Um, where that where that is practical and where that makes sense. You now, starting with the food system, stop at starting with social services. Um, have have centralized support structures, but localized control, because the economy is way beyond in complexity for any kind of centralized solution. Um, as we can clearly see in, in environmental issues, but it's also uh, the socio socioeconomic conditions are so different, uh, even within a country, certainly like the US. So it has, to, it has to move to local and then empower people to help themselves, protect themselves. I, I, don't, I don't see uh, any, any centralized local, uh, uh, solution to, to, any, uh, to any of our issues. And as Ken Homer would ask if he were here, who who is we? When we say we, who are we referring to? We say we. I, I'm referring to to those uh, sane enough to wanting to uh, protect yourself and and looking for this collective uh, uh, well-being. And this is what uh, the point that was raised earlier. You know, we have to shift focus away from us as individuals and. Uh, our individual uh, uh, center here and think about it in terms of the uh, uh, social network we're embedded within and make sure that stays healthy and, 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 uh, and in good shape. Um, Michael. Um, actually picking up on, on something Klaus was saying and, uh, and also harkening back to during the early part of the call, I was not... Uh, I didn't have a great connection, so I missed some stuff. But one thing I did hear was um, 
Stuart poking fun at himself a bit about, at, in one sentence, um, saying something about world government and, you know, uh, forces bubbling up from the decentralized masses. He didn't use the word decentralized, but, but I, I think at the risk of being labeled something of a techno utopian by saying so, um, there is something in looking at, um, in, in New York during Hurricane Sandy, one of the most um, dynamic disaster responses was from the network of the Occupy Wall Street movement, um, which was this kind of leaderless network that was just in position to respond to things in a way that hierarchical forces were not and made a lot of good stuff happen and ended up being worked with and depended on by some of the more you know conventional governmental um apparatus whatever the word is um and i do think that there's a potential for a world government to bubble up from the decentralized you know just just you know the membrane of of all of our um you know, all of our, not necessarily all the same, we're not gonna have a majoritarian, you know, rule of the world, but, you know, certain things are gonna be more important in, in certain localities and certain regions. And, um, and for populations to put themselves in a position where their connection is so great that they're in a position to virtually disregard the, the nations, the you know, authorities above them, um, is a goal worth at least examining. Um, so, yeah, my thought. Um, Michael, thank you. That's a beautiful. That's a beautiful thought to leave us with. I really appreciate that. Um, oh, and Stuart just posted the poem of the day, number twenty-four. which we can all read and then I'll close down the call. Actually, do you want to read it to us, Stuart? Uh, you're muted. Sure, thank, thank you, you for asking. Um, it's called Breakthrough and it's today's poem. Uh, on a personal verge, step forward, exhibit nerve. World not a frightening place, opportunity to express grace. Tears shed, war, roar with laughter. Focus on a compelling after. Learn lessons, source of wisdom, grow from beauty in them. We all need absolution, preparing for a next solution. Never perfect, at times cruel, sometimes caviar, sometimes gruel. Nearing breakthroughs you need, will coming years bring more greed? Have enough to meet needs, have more time, do good deeds. Beyond a problem mindset, see what's here. And yet, challenge for one and all, learn, think, no need fall. Essential surround us here, potential bliss, little fear. Live in a grateful way, count blessings, sit and pray. Thank you very, very much. And thank you all for, for this great conversation and for being here. Thanks everyone. Bye for now.